Okay, so we'll take the, we are going to look at the next lemma, sparsification lemma, which will come up basically in this talk and in the afternoon talk and perhaps other times. And uh, um, so this part of it is, is a kind of non-constructive lower bound part of my talk. And, uh, but it gives one motivation, or, or it gives you one motivation for understanding sparsification lemma. So let's go back to depth three circuit lower bounds. So with all the PPSC and PPZ, we achieved a small improvement, very, very tiny improvement. Although it is satisfying that we have tight lower bounds for parity, but beyond that, so the achievement is extremely small. And, uh, and uh, perhaps there are deeper reasons. Uh, why, why, why this approach may not work, but but I want to show that um, that uh, that uh, so the kind of lower bonds we want are of the type two to the n minus little of n, and if we can achieve such lower bonds for depth three circuits, that will show certain problems cannot be computed by um, linear size series parallel circuits. So that may be one of the nearest goals we may have. Okay. And uh, so there, there's no progress except for a very, very tiny improvement. And, uh, and uh, I want to give an argument that shows that a random degree two polynomial, GF2 polynomial, requires size two to the n minus little of s. It is somewhat ad hoc and counting argument. And it will not get used anywhere at this point. We haven't been uh, go beyond that random argument. Uh, beyond that counting argument, but but at least it gives you shows you the power of a sparsification lemma. Okay, so that's that's one way to look at it. Okay. So the goal is to show that a low complexity function requires large s. Okay, and um, um, so the low complexity here turns out to be the uh, run, uh, so, so degree two polynomial. Simple counting will not achieve such a, a, a straightforward counting will not achieve uh, such a lower bound. And, uh, and uh, so we're going to show slightly more careful argument, which Rahul has exploited to prove similar bounds in other cases, okay. uh, similar non-constructive bounds. Okay. So let's assume that uh, um, um, uh, So we have a balanced function, so that has rough, so so that has roughly kind of equal number of zeros and ones, and uh, we have a circuit size um, uh, of two to the n minus little of n. By using the top-down argument, we can show that a, that a case that one depth two subcircuit accepts two to the little of n many uh, many of the ones. So look at the function f. So look at its inverse and the set. Uh, the set of inputs that produce one, one KCNF must capture uh, at least two to the little of n of them while rejecting all the zeros. So what we're going to do is that we take a degree, uh, uh, degree two GF2 random polynomial and argue that uh, with high probability that such a polynomial cannot capture that many ones. Uh, that, that the KCNF cannot capture many ones of this uh, so degree two polynomial. Okay, so let so let's do the argument in the following way. So we so let's assume the circuit is computing the function f and the subcircuit is capturing uh, um, two to the little of n many inputs, and it so look at the KCNF. It has this solution space of size two to the little of n, and uh, and uh, we look at the VC dimension of this space. So think of the um, satisfying assignments of the KCNF as a system of sets. And the system of sets has a, a large size, two to the little of n. And therefore, it must have large VC dimension. And, uh, um, and uh, uh, so let D be the VC dimension. And through, yeah, through standard calculations, we can show that D is at least uh, um, uh, so two to the little uh, so d is at least little of n so over some log factors. So, so so that means we have d variables. Assume without loss of generality, these are the first d variables. 
these d variables are shattered, uh, shattered in all possible ways by the subsets of f inverse of 1. So we are going to select, okay, I'm going to go back and forth between satisfying assignments as assignments and subsets. Okay. So let's select 2 to the d assignments from, oh, okay, from f inverse of 1 such that in the first d variables you'll get all possible combinations among these so, uh, 2 to the d assignments. And, uh, and write the remaining coordinates as, uh, as functions of the first d variables. So for each setting of the d variables, select one satisfying assignment and write the remaining variables as a, as a function of the first d variables. So you can do that always, and in fact, you can do that as a, a degree d polynomial, so degree d gf2 polynomial. Because this input, once you fix the setting of the d variables, and you are selecting a particular satisfying assignment, and that, uh, uh, and once that assignment is set, so you can, so, so, so you can write, uh, so you can write uh, the bits as a function of the first d inputs. Okay. So what you got is the set d sub f of two to the d size. So you can think of it as uh, so d, in, so d variables as input, and n minus d variables as output. And uh, these output variables are governed uh, as polynomials of degree d. So, so, you're, so each of the pi's is a coordinate that tells you what the value of like x d plus one is. Uh, so, so you've got an x which is y followed by a bunch of stuff, and so x sub one through x of d is y sub one through x y sub d, and then the rest of the values each. PI is just telling you one bit of the output. Right. So each PI, yeah. Okay. Yeah, think of it as the following input output. You have D variables as input, and you have N minus D variables as output. So each output variable can be expressed as a function of the D inputs. So, yeah, so X to the side equals PI of 1. So without loss of generality, we can think of P sub I as a multilinear, so degree D GF2 polynomial because every Boolean function can be coded by such a polynomial. Okay, so, this, so far what I'm saying is play, uh, kind of simple facts, so, so there's no magic here, and uh, I'm clear, I don't know what this set, uh, what this set is, and uh, I do, uh, what I do know is that there are, uh, there are um, so a two, to the D, a 2 to the D inputs such that, that the first D coordinates are completely shattered. So it, it is degree d just because it is multilinear and it depends on the Yeah, basically it depends only on d variables and, uh, and you only have, uh, right. So you only have two to the d vectors you selected and those vectors only, def yeah, they differ in the d variables, right? in the first d variables. So you can view the later variables as, uh, as functions of the first d variables. So one thing is that okay, we selected this subset d sub f, and uh, the function f, the function f is constant on this set, and the KCN f is also constant on this set. And uh, um, and uh, so so what we argue is that uh, um, uh, that if you take a random degree two polynomial. Such a polynomial is constant on this kind of set with probability at most, so 2 to the minus d squared. So let me say the following way. So you take this set of, uh, so d sub f is a particular set of inputs. And what is the probability that a random degree 2 polynomial is constant on this set of inputs? Why, why are you using degree 2 as opposed to degree d? Don't Okay. I'm going to show for a degree two. Okay, degree two polynomials require two to the n minus little of n size for depth three circuits. So the function I'm computing is a degree two polynomial. It's only stronger. Oh, 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 I see. So the right. okay. okay. So the polynomials have there are two different types of GF two polynomials: the degree right. d right. ones for the coordinate right. and the. So the other yeah. One is, this is going to be your input polynomial. So so we so we are going to look at uh, degree two. Okay, we're going to look at the computation of degree two polynomials by depth three circuits with the bottom fan in K, and we are going to argue they require size two to the n minus little of n. So to make the argument, we are going to focus on the KCNF. 
Okay. And we know that any uh, circuit that has smaller size must, uh, must accept a large fraction of ones of this degree two polynomial. And, uh, and, uh, and as a consequence, okay, see, it has a nice subset of uh, things that it accepts, and that set is called D sub F. And uh, so what I'm doing is that I'm going to, uh, so D sub F itself is expressed in terms of polynomial equations. So I'm going to eliminate, so I take my degree two polynomial, I'm going to make it more explicit on this set. So let me put it this way, and uh, on, uh, on the set D sub F, the degree two polynomial is constant. Okay. And, uh, um, um, so I'm going to eliminate all the variables except the first D variables using the equations I have and make this a polynomial as a degree D polynomial or degree uh, polynomial in uh, so D variables. And still it should be constant, but a polynomial in D variables is constant only when it is either zero or one because there's a normal form for multilinear polynomials. So, so the argument I'm going to make is that when you eliminate variables from the degree two polynomials using the set D sub F, uh, that a random polynomial is not likely to be constant. <coughs> so the probability of that being constant is no more than two to the minus D square. Um, um, and uh, uh, and uh, so therefore, right. So, so then we are going to multiply this probability with the number of sets d sub f. Okay. So each KCN of that accepts a large enough, uh, a large enough number of ones of the random degree two polynomial uh, leads to this nice set d sub f. Okay, and such a nice set th that a random degree two polynomial cannot be constant, but there are only so many KCN of we can argue. Or we need to deal with, so we multiply this probability with the number of KCNFs, and if the prob, and if the product is less than one, so we, so we will have shown there exists at least one degree two polynomial that requires size two to the n minus two to the n. So that's the overall argument. Okay. So far, it's a trivial counting argument. So the key here is that uh, proving it for degree two polynomials, two is fixed; it doesn't depend on k. So that's where the magic comes in. So that's where we need kind of large, more powerful tools to prove this. So simple counting, simple arguments will not suffice. Okay, so let me, um, um, so let me give this uh, proof for this, uh, 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 proof for the last statement. Okay, so, so just imagine a degree two polynomial and assume it's random, okay. Fix all its monomials, so there are some monomials that deal that that purely consist of uh, uh, terms from from among the d variables. So you have the first d variables. There are some monomials that only consist of variables from this set. The rest of the monomials consist of other uh, variables. So fix all other monomials except those that exclusively deal with the d variables. So replace each of the last n minus d variables, so using those polynomial equations. So then you get some gigantic polynomial of degree, of degree uh, d, it's in the d variables. But you still haven't fixed roughly d squared many monomials. And each monomial, are, uh, and each d squared such monomial can be, can be I, I can have a coefficient one or zero with equal probability. The probability that this polynomial will turn out to be a zero polynomial or constant polynomial so is at most so two to the minus d squared. So you are essentially reducing this degree two polynomial on n variables to be a polynomial on d variables, and without fixing some of the monomials. And uh, and that's where you retain some control, and therefore you cannot make it constant. Uh, Unless it's with a small probability. So this is a uh, uh, this has nothing to do with circuit complexity. Kind of clever argument using VC dimension and uh, and uh, um, okay. So now we need to multiply this probability two to the minus d square with uh, 
the number of uh, uh, such sets d sub f. The number of such sets can be bounded by the number of KCNFs. The number of KCNFs is 2 to the n to the k roughly. But whereas uh, uh, the probability here is 2 to the minus d square. So there is no comparison between 2 to the n to the k and 2 to the minus d square. Okay. So we are kind of lost already. So now comes to our rescue. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, this is the first lower bound argument we found for the sparsification lemma, although it's non-constructive. So let me introduce sparsification lemma here. How? So basically, sparsification lemma takes a KCNF and shows that how it can be represented by using linear size uh, a KCNF. So why, and why did they say that there are two to the n to the k many many KCNF? Because KCNF may have roughly n to the k many k clauses. So that's a set of all possible k clauses, and uh, so you can select any subset of them, create a KCNF. So that's why you have roughly two to the n to the k. So this lemma says that uh, that there is a kind of normal form for KCNF, and uh, that normal form turns out to be quite useful in a number of contexts, and I will talk more about it later. And the normal form is basically the following thing: that so you can write this KCNF as as a union of linear size KCNFs. By linear, I mean the, the frequency of each variable is at most roughly k to the k. And this expression can be done in sub-exponential time. So the key thing is that it's not clear how to write a KCNF as a union of linear size KCNFs in polynomial time. But if we allow sub-exponential time, it seems we can do that one. So that's what specification must be. And 2 to the k seems like uh, uh, the, the frequency of 2 to the k seems necessary, and uh, the best we could get is a, a k to the k. <clears throat> so now you can imagine depth three circuits in the following way. So you have, so the top gate is OR gate, so then you have an AND gate followed by, kind of, uh, uh, followed by OR gates. Or you can look at the depth three circuit as a disjunction of KCNFs. Now what this is saying is that replace each KCNF with a disjunction of smaller size KCNFs. Smaller means linear size. Of course, the, so the top OR gate has a fan in something like 2 to the epsilon and where epsilon is an arbitrarily small constant. Oh, is it, so the size of these is small because uh, each, only because of condition 2 that says each literal doesn't occur too many times? Right. That, that's the thing that says each of these right. phi i's is a small yeah, linear size. Yeah, uh, is a linear size right. formula. So uh, we control the frequency of the literal uh, uh, variables. Yeah, that's a, that's even a stronger a stronger bound, and uh, um, and epsilon is uh, yeah. So that's a, that's an arbitrary constant, um, and. Uh, um, so if you now look at the depth three circuit, it can be converted into a circuit. Uh, where where the top, so we have two layers of, uh, the top two layers are disjunctions, and the top layer has a fan in like 2 to the n minus little o of n, so the next layer of disjunction has a fan in of 2 to the epsilon n, and then you have KCNF, uh, and then you have linear size KCNFs. So now you can squish this into a depth 3 circuit, Okay, since epsilon is arbitrarily small, so we still have 2 to the n minus little of n, uh, um, a little of n size circuit, and where the bottom level circuit, sub-circuits are linear size KCNFs. Okay. Now we can count, now if you count the, uh, the number of linear size KCNFs, okay, that is something like n choose k choose n. So you have n choose k uh, clauses roughly, kind of ignoring the positive and negative literals, and, uh, and then you choose linearly many of them, um, time, uh, so that's roughly kind of n choose uh, k choose n, uh, so that's, that, uh, that is n to the k to the power n. Okay. 
So that's roughly so two to the a big O of n log n. So the number of KCNFs we need to deal with is is not dependent on k strongly at this point, and it's of the form two to the n log n. And whereas the degree two polynomials, sorry, degree d po, uh, uh, two polynomials, uh, uh, when d is sufficiently large, so d square uh, can outweigh so n log n. So therefore, now when you take the product of two to the minus d square with uh, with two to the n log n, so we come out ahead. So we can then prove that there are degree two polynomials that must take uh, size two to the n minus little of n. So that little of n must I cannot be I cannot be I should be of the right size. So square uh, should be slightly more than square root n. So this is a uh, this is your first introduction to sparsification lemma. I will not go over the proof of this, and uh, I will give you a sketch toward. Uh, uh, I'll give a sketch in the afternoon, and uh, so just to give you an idea that a, a property of KCNF can be so can be helpful to prove lower bounds, and there are many other applications, including uh, uh, right, uh, showing certain directions exist, and uh, so we'll talk about them later. So this is how we complete. So basically, basically, it's almost all degree two polynomials um, uh, require size two to the n minus little of n. So as long as k is little of log n, the bound on k comes because the because the variables occur with frequency k to the k. So that's where k will play a role, and uh, so you can get to manageable size up until k is little of log n. Um, So that means we have a constant degree, and no matter what. So the reason this is somewhat technically significant is the following thing. So if you look at so one of the challenge questions for depth three circuits, a depth three circuit lower bound. So the goal is to prove a two to the n over two lower bound, no matter what the bottom fan n is. Okay, that breaks through the barrier of the product uh, times log of the uh, product of the bottom fan in times log of the top fan. So you want to break the dependency between a bottom fan in and the top fan in. So, so here that polynomial, I mean, there is some analogy here. The, so degree two polynomials are, are sufficient for our purposes, and, uh, and we don't know how to construct one such. And uh, um, the, there may be deep reasons why this may be hard, and uh, I don't know. Yeah. So, of course, obviously, making it more constructive will be interesting, and making it fully construct, finding a uh, finding a function in NP that can be represented as a degree two polynomial that has this property, uh, that will that will be very very interesting. So, uh, one question. Yeah. Can you use this falsification lemma to go back and say something about uh, those polynomials P1 through? P n minus d, you have like some simplification of them. I don't see how it would help. Uh, so we small um, no simplification will help in any case. So the argument. Um, Yes, if we know something very specific about pi, so that will help. Something constructive about p sub i that will help. And uh, since we don't know how this f inverse of one is distributed among the KCNFs, I don't know how kind of easy it would be to say something positive or something constructive about. It. But lowering the degree itself may not be sufficient. Okay, so the last part of this talk is uh, switching lemma. Okay, this clearly is one of the so deepest results in circuit complexity, and uh, and uh, I assume okay. So let me just read the the classical theorem or lemma, and so we have a KCNF and uh, sparse or otherwise. See, it's not so important here. 
So we take a random restriction. So, um, so random, okay, you can think of a restriction as a mapping from the variables to 0, 1, and star. If a variable is mapped to 0, then it's set to 0. So if it's mapped to 1, it's set to 1. So that's understanding. If a variable is mapped to star, that is, then, then we call it unset. Okay. So you take a random restriction. So random means that this mapping is random. And uh, with the P and unset variables, the, the star variables. The theorem says um, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, so the decision tree of the formula of the KCNF under this random restriction you know, has height more than t is bounded by, um, so the decision tree falls exponentially. So for example, you would like to take uh, P to be 1 in 10K. So 1 in 10K fraction of the variables are unset, then 5PK will be half. So then you have 2 to the minus T probability that the correspond that, that the restricted formula has a decision tree complexity more than T. So, um, um, right. But what is the value of this star template? Would it be the same as if you select less uh, or sample less vertices? But uh, uh, choose only assignment to zero and one, or it's it's really important that you select this star so, selection. Say it again. So you want? So is it important that you have uh, mapping into three values, zero, one, and star? So what happens if you have <laughs> mappings only to one and zero? And, uh, and if you map everything, then of course we are talking about the restricted formula. So if you map all the variables to constants, then the restricted formula will be simpler. So the more variables you have unset, so the greater, uh, so the so the stronger the statement is. Would it be just the same that if you select less vertices in your sample, or it's really important that you take instead? So uh, setting fewer variables is a good thing. So the remaining variables are star variables. It's a function of the, the, the resulting function is a function of the variables that are set to star. So, right, so star just is a way of saying don't set that. Okay. And you're only interested in what's left over as a function of those star variables. But what's the difference? You don't set any value for the, for the variable? or you exactly, don't set the exactly the same. That's exactly the same. Okay. Okay, thank you. So your yeah, better thing is unset, so we're not doing anything to that variable. So that's what star means. Okay, so... Uh, yeah. the, the decision tree height we're looking at, is, yeah. is this um, like the minimal decision tree or like a canonical one? Or? So we, yeah, we'll talk about a canonical. So this is not minimum. We can uh, constructively show that. So we're going to go have a standard method for constructing decision trees. And in that standard method, that, it, that, that we are unlikely to exceed the height t. Right. So, so what's the value of this one? So, so basically, so you can, uh, so that means if you have a small decision tree, so that means it's a CNF complexity and the DNF complexity are both small. So you can express it as a small, small width DNF or small width CNF. So, so you can start with a KCNF, which, uh, which need not necessarily have a um, um, small width DNF. But once we apply the random restriction, so then with high probability, it has a small width as so a DNF. So then we can combine. So this can be used as a tool, uh, as an inductive, uh, uh, to make an inductive argument on the depth of the circuit. So let's say we have a depth three circuit, okay, uh, pi sigma uh, pi, for example. So you take the bottom subcircuit, which is a CNF. We apply random restriction. Most likely, it will be a DNF of uh, a, a small width. Then we can take the depth, uh, uh, the top level gate and the second level gate, and combine them into one single, uh, one single circuit or one single layer. That will give us a DNF of small width. So this is a technique for reducing the depth of the circuit after the random restriction. So then we can inductively argue on the remaining circuit. So, um, so 
I'm not going to say a lot more in uh, say a lot about switching lemma. I, I assume, of course, in this presentation, I'm assuming it's a background material. I'm going to say something, something what happened after that, or some extensions of it, and their applications to lower bounds and upper bounds. So using switching lemma, as I was saying before, one can prove um, lower bounds of the form uh, 2 to the square root and over 10 for parity, for, um, for computing parity okay, by depth 3 circuits. So this is a standard tool. And, this, uh, and, in, and more importantly, using switching lemma, you can show for depth D circuits, pari uh, computing parity takes size 2 to the n to the 1 over D, roughly, okay. ignoring constants. So the previous argument I showed about satisfiable decoding lemma makes the argument somewhat tighter for, for computing parity by depth three circuits. Okay, so that's where the satisfiable decoding lemma was somewhat helpful. But otherwise, this is the, so this is the reigning truth, uh, or, or the, uh, this is the most important thing we know about dealing with AC0 circuits. So we are motivated by, OK, where do we go from here? So we are motivated by the following question. Can we come up with a satisfiability algorithm for AC0 circuits that has the right type of savings? Savings that generalizes from the KCNF savings. So KCNF has a savings like 1 over K. OK. And uh, can we, so let's, uh, can we, can we extend those savings for constant depth circuits? So that's the question. And we show how to extend a, a switching lemma to tackle depth, uh, depth D circuits and come up with a somewhat efficient satisfiable algorithm that seem to generalize the PPSC and PPSC. Not the constants, but the flavor of the argument. So we also prove strong correlation lower bounds for parity. Okay. So using the switching lemma, or the extended switching lemma. Okay. Um, so, um, so the key is extending the switching lemma to deal with the classes of formulas rather than a single KCNF. So let me take you through uh, through uh, uh, through some definitions before I get to that. So we're dealing with depth D circuits. So let me use the following parameterization. So the number of variables is n. So m is the number of gates in the circuit. So d is the depth. Okay. And you have layers of and or gates. And uh, and um, um, let's let's uh, let's say that m equals c n. C could be a function of n. So that's how I'm parameterizing it. So the point, this parameterization is useful when m is linear, uh, c becomes more prominent, and uh, and and that's the reason for the parameterization. Or for now, you can think of it as a linear cell circuit, but, but C can be viewed as a function of N, and, and all the arguments generalize in that case. Okay. So let's uh, look at even more special circuits. Same class of circuits as before, but the bottom fan in is bounded by K. And, uh, so this is the satisfiability algorithm. Let me first make the statement. So we have a randomized algorithm that succeeds with a constant probability in finding a satisfying assignment when there is one. And, uh, and it takes as input um, um, a, a circuit with, uh, uh, with n variables, c n size, and depth d, and, uh, um, and, uh, and produces a satisfiability algorithm and produces a satisfying assignment with high probability, and where the savings is of the form, kind of ignore the d log d factor. So it's a d log d term for now. So that's something we tried hard to get rid of. It seems that's, uh, so, so that may be necessary. So one way to think about it is basically, basically the savings is 1 in log c to the power d minus 1. This strictly generalizes the previous algorithms in the format. So if you look at uh, the PPZ algorithm, okay. that's 1 in k. And if you think about sparsification, and if you uh, can improve the uh, sparsification constant to 2 to, to, to the k, so the kind of worst case instances of KCNF are those when you have frequencies of the variables around 2 to the k. So that means they have size 2 to the k times n. So if you take c, the, so, so that means c is like 2 to the k. So log c is like k. Okay. 
So one in K kind of generalizes to one in log C. So that's the right. That seems to be the right generalization subject to our state of understanding. Okay. And there's a dependence on depth. And the dependence on the depth seems to be like when the depth is uh, uh, two, like in the case of K, C, and F. So you have one in log C. So when the depth is three, the, okay, one in log C squared. That seems to be the best known dependence between between the depth and size parameters and the satisfiability savings. Significant improvements in this one, or, or so, further improvements in this one, will have significant consequences. And uh, so that's the result. And this comes again from uh, the switching lemma, an extended switching lemma. Maybe worth noting that this algorithm also can count the number of satisfying assignments, right, whereas right. PPZ could not. Right. By the way, so this result uh, is independently obtained by uh, uh, Johan True, and uh, I would like to mention that. And we both were working in parallel, it turns out. And uh, this is due to Russell, myself, and William, and uh, um, our student. Right. So this can also count the number of satisfying assignments in the same time. So the key, and, uh, and thereby it also shows, so let me show you the next argument. So it also shows a strong correlation bound, an exponentially strong correlation bound. So um, this is the definition of correlation between functions and how uh, likely they, so they agree with each other on a random input, and, uh, and, uh, and the correlation coefficient can be defined to q minus 1. And, uh, so we're going to define a correlation between a function and a class of functions. So what's the closest function so to this function f from the family? And we assume, typically we assume that the class f is, a bond, is closed under complementation, so then the correlation will be between 0 and 1. Okay. And, uh, um, and uh, so we are going to show, so the, um, um, so zero basically, okay, when the correlation is zero means that, uh, the, func that the two functions f and g kind of agree half the time and disagree half the time. Okay, so that's a normalization. Okay. So, so the result we show is that the correlation between, uh, between parity and a circuit of the type NMD is, is given by that bound. So 2 to the minus mu times n, mu is the satisfiability savings that we showed before. And, uh, and this is strong exponentially, uh, so, so this is an exponential, strongly exponentially small correlation between parity and, uh, and functions computed by such circuits. Right. So, so we can also count, as Holger said, we can also count the number of satisfying assignment in the same time. And, uh, uh, So, um, so unify. Okay. So, what can we say about the further improvements? And if we can improve, so that okay, that log m should have been log m over n. Okay. So then it will become log c. But but at uh, okay, when m is very very large, it's m over n it doesn't have much of an impact. And if we can improve the exponent of the savings to be little of d. So using Williams, uh, uh, no, using Ryan's techniques, we can show that uh, uh, so that uh, so that next is not a subset of NC1. Okay. So we kind of almost reach the limits of uh, the technology at this point. We need new ideas. So either by improving the satisfiable algorithm or some other technique to prove lower bounds. So that was the motivating factor for this uh, for this. Uh, uh, for this series of research, can we prove strong lower bounds and depth three circuits, or depth D circuits in general, which will uh, which will imply so lower bounds on kind of linear size log depth circuits, or NC1 more generally, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, so we got satisfiable to algorithms, and they prove strong correlation um, lower bounds, but uh, but the real breakthrough is still not there. And whether it comes through satisfiability improvement or some other some other technique, we don't know. Okay, let me give you a sketch of the proof, and within the 15 minutes. So what we are going to so if you go back to the switching lemma, 
what it says is that once you apply a random restriction, very likely you will have a small decision tree complexity. So, uh, of course, there is a probability that is, uh, there is some probability exponentially small, but there, uh, nevertheless, there is some probability that the, that the decision tree may be, may be a full length. Okay. Now, because how are we going to use this uh, random restriction type of argument towards a better satisfiable algorithm? So, uh, we select a random restriction. So, th so the way we do that is in the following way. Okay, we select the variables. Okay, we select a random se uh, set of variables of the right size to be set to 0 or 1. Okay. So that is of size n minus p, and p is the probability of not setting a variable. Then we are going to look at all possible possible assignments to these variables. So we're going to explore all possible assignments. That's a 2 to the n minus uh, p n many settings. And if in each such setting we have a small uh, a small KCNF or small KDNF, we can now uh, we can uh, then apply. Um, so we're going to look at each such settings. So that means we have an exponentially long algorithm already. And if the circuit simplifies in each such setting, okay, we can squish the next tool whereas come up with a smaller circuit of lower depth. So then we can recurse the argument. So that's the hope. So we simplify the circuits, and uh, and uh, so then have a lower depth. So then and maintain the size, and then hope to conduct the same argument. So so the problem is that we we don't. Uh, we don't necessarily get small decision tree always, and uh, and there are many. Um, so we have to cont So we need to con So let's take a depth three circuit as a kind of running argument, especially a pi sigma a pi circuit with the bottom fan in K. Okay. So to get the induction going, we need to take the bottom level uh, uh, DNF, convert that into a CNF. Okay. So then we can do the induction. So when you apply random restriction to the bottom level sequence of KDNFs, not all of them will convert uh, to KCNFs. Okay. Some of them will still have large decision tree complexity. And we need to kind of contend with the situation. And, uh, and there could be correlations among the KDNFs. And, uh, and so what we are going to argue instead is that rather than looking at a canonical decision tree for one single KCNF or KDNF, so we are going to look at a canonical a decision tree for a sequence of KDNFs or sequence of KCNFs and show this long decision tree that, that works for all KCNFs or KDNFs is not necessarily that long. So we apply, so uh, uh, we prove a result very similar to the trust switching lemma in flavor and in quantitatively speaking. And, uh, and uh, uh, we, so we'll be able to so deal with a sequence of KDNFs. So before that, let me introduce some notation. And, uh, and, uh, and so the idea is that, so remember the top level argument I'm saying that, uh, that once you take this set of variables, random set of variables, sub, and then instantiate them. So you'd like to see some simplicity. So the resulting KDNF should simplify, uh, should turn into a, a decision trees with a small, a small complexity. But that's not going to be completely true. So we're going to further refine the space, and within that restricted space, so we can find simplicity. Okay. So for that reason, so we're going to introduce this, uh, uh, this notation. So we say, if, uh, we say a set of functions partitions of the space, the Boolean cube, uh, provided the set of ones of each of the functions to so define the partition. And, uh, and so let's call each part a region, and each region is defined by the, by the set of ones of the corresponding function. And these functions, g's, will be very simple. So, g's will, so each g will be a capital G, which will be a KCNF and a row, which is a restriction. So restriction sets some variable to 0 and 1, and leaves other variables untouched. So we are going to find regions which are defined by simple functions like a, like a KCNF and a restriction. And within those regions, we argue that, uh, that the sequence of KDNFs can be simplified. So two circuits are equivalent within a region if they're equivalent restricted to, that, uh, to those inputs. Okay. 
So this is a long definition, mouthful of a definition, but simply what it is saying is that, so you take a circuit C, okay, and, uh, and, uh, and we, partition the, uh, we partition the space of all inputs, and within each uh, partition or region, the circuit C will simplify to be C sub i. And C sub i should be a lot simpler compared to C, so that's, that's the kind of writing we want to, that's the kind of uh, simplification we want. So let me also introduce canonical decision trees. And um, so canonical decision trees, so you fix an order for the clauses of the uh, formula of the CNF. And if a clause is empty, so then return zero. And if there are no clauses, return one. So otherwise, take the next clause and query the variables in that order, and um, and then restrict the formula, and then repeat the process. So this is just build the uh, build the cannot, uh, build the decision tree. So using some ordering of the variables and clauses. So similarly, we can build a canonical decision tree for a sequence of uh, uh, for a sequence of KCNFs or KDNFs. So we do the same thing once you know. Now, uh, so we build a canonical decision tree for the first formula. Okay. So along each path, we restrict the remaining formulas. Or basically, at each leaf, we restrict the remaining formula. And, uh, and then we recurse. So the point is that towards the very end, so you, so, you, so you have leaves. So these leaves fix particular values for each of the formulas. So therefore, the leaves are labeled by tuples of zeros and ones, or one for each of the formulas f. Okay. So th I think of this as a joint decision tree for the sequence or the set of formulas. So, so what might happen is that once you query uh, the clauses of a particular, uh, a particular formula, and then you try to build the decision tree for the next uh, formula, Maybe that formula is already simplified. You don't need uh, so you don't need to query uh, the clauses of that formula. Okay. So therefore, we want to uh, come up with this notion whether a clause contributes variables to a path or not. So that a formula contributes variables to a path along in this tree, provided there is a clause of that formula that is queried. And if no clause is queried. Because if no clause of a particular formula is queried along a path, that formula played no role along that path. Okay. So with that definition, so let me talk about the extender switching lemma. So what extender switching lemma does is that it builds this canonical decision tree, shows can builds the canonical decision tree, and shows such a canonical decision tree after applying the random restriction will not have a long length. So, so we take a random restriction with the different parameters here, and uh, and uh, the combined decision tree or the joint decision tree has a path of length length longer than t. Okay, where uh, where each f sub i contributes at least one such node or one such variable along the path is 13 p k to the t. So it's possible some formulas got simplified, so they're not querial along the path. Okay, we are focusing on those where, where every single formula is queried. So this is very much similar uh, to the switching lemma in spirit, and, uh, and we are building joint decision trees, and we are arguing with this modified definition that uh, so these trees need not be too long. So that doesn't depend on M at all? So it doesn't depend on? The number of, you have M different formulas, and the rest of the lemma it depends on t, but so we are assuming that each so each uh, so each formula is queried. Okay. But we have in, when we apply this, then so this is a, assuming that every fi is involved. When we apply it at the next stage, we're going to have to do a union bound over all the clauses that are of subsets that could have that could contribute to the path. So, so what right. The, there's some implicit condition where t is at least m in this. I mean, uh, right now, m has no. Right. So t has to be at least m. Okay. Or else it doesn't make sense. Right. 
Right. So each yeah. variable is queried. So things get simplified and certain formulas may not be queried. So therefore, you look at all subsets of formulas that are being used, and we are going to multiply with that. So T is large, yeah. So I'm not going to show how we're going to apply that, but let me first state the result. And so this is the, so this is the result that's going to be useful for, uh, for proving, uh, or for obtaining a satisfiable algorithm. And uh, so we have the sequence of KDNFs. And, uh, and what the switching algorithm does is that it's a, uh, it's a randomized algorithm that succeeds with a constant probability. And, uh, and it partitions the space into, into regions where each region is defined by a KCNF and a restriction, such that within the region, the, KD, the sequence of KDNFs can be expressed as a sequence of KCNFs. So, um, right. so, so I'm hiding a lot of detail and and the connection between this uh, lemma and the previous one. But so this is sufficient to show how we can obtain a better satisfiable algorithm for depth three circuits. So then we can do a similar. Okay. So this works as long as the size of the circuit. Um, right. So the size of the partitioning is bounded by that, uh, bounded by that number. and. Uh, and uh, uh, right, of course, M plays a role, and uh, so th um, right. So if M is too large, that will overwhelm the savings we obtain. So, so, so the savings is n in 100k. Okay, that is offset by the size of M, and uh, and uh, that that's where the dependence comes. So let me show you how to apply this for depth three circuits. So we have a depth three circuit. So think of it as pi sigma pi, and or and. And that means that the bottom two levels are a sequence of DNFs. And, uh, um, and I will come up with a satisfiable algorithm that achieves savings roughly one in log C squared. So, um, so we're going to apply Schuller's type of argument. Remember the sigma pi, uh, I remember pi sigma pi circuit is arbitrary circuit, so there's no fan in restriction to begin with. So we apply Schuller-like argument to restrict the fan in to be k. Okay. And, uh, and uh, so there's some overhead, and that overhead is minimal, so that's not going to, and k is going to be kind of order log c. And c is the size of the circuit, cn is the size of the circuit. Okay. Basically, order log C seems to be the optimal value for K. And so we convert the circuit into bottom fan in K circuits. So that's the first step. So then we apply switching algorithm, where we uh, partition the space into, <coughs> into many regions. So each region is essentially defined by KCNF. Okay. And within each region, the sequence of KDNFs can be expressed as a sequence of KCNFs. Now, now we can take the defining KCNF and the sequence of KCNF, which are the result of our, uh, our input circuit, and write it as one big KCNF. And take the top AND gate, kind of write as one big KCNF. So within each region, yeah, so we can collapse uh, the levels and then attach the defining KCNF. So that means as long as that KCNF is true, that we are computing the satisfiability for that, uh, uh, for that region. And uh, so we write everything as one single KCNF. So then apply the KSAT algorithm for this KCNF. So then we have, so that gives an overall savings of one in log C squared. So this is what, so this is the ideal thing you will expect. So, so let's say that uh, so we apply random restriction with parameter like p being one in, uh, 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 one in k. So you saved n over k variables. So then you simplified everything from a kDNF to a kCNF, and you apply the algorithm again. 
then you get a savings of 1 in k of n over k, that's 1 in k square. So that's the best you can hope for given the kind of technology we have, kind of how we can deal with KCN, kind of one KCNF at a time. So that's how we know how to uh, do a satisfiability algorithm. And uh, so this achieves the basically almost the best possible uh, bound subject to kind of a subject to improving KCNF. Stopping exactly on that. Questions? <laughs>